Save the Scriptures, a production of the Bethel Baptist Church in Prospect, Connecticut. I'm Pastor Ed Bucard. I'd like to welcome you to today's message. We're going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'd like you to have a pencil and paper handy every time you hear this broadcast so that you can write down the biblical references and check them out for yourself uh, to see whether the things we say are so. Now, it's important that we rightly divide the Word of God the word of truth, and uh, we're going to take this from 1 Corinthians, we're going to read uh, chapter 15 from verse 1 down to verse 26, so it's important that as you read, you understand, and I know in a segment uh, this short, uh, you're not going to be able to comprehend a lot, that's why it's important for you to write down these references and read them over slowly so that you can grasp what the understanding is. All right, beginning in verse 1, moreover, brethren... I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory, what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, who is Peter, then of the twelve, after that he was seen of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep, some are died. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles, and last of all he was seen of me as of one born out of due time, for I am the least of the apostles, that, and, that am not meet to be called an apostle, this is written by Paul, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was bestowed upon me, was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Therefore, whether it were I or they, so we preach, and so ye believe. Now if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen, obviously. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be that the dead rise not. For if the dead rise not, then is not Christ raised. And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep, those who have died, in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And for as in Adam... Even so, in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Have a word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We ask, Father, that this message be filled with your power to open up the eyes of the blind and help the, uh, those who uh, won't hear the truth to hear the truth. And that, Lord, your word will be magnified in everyone. Glorify yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, there you have it. 1 Corinthians 15 tells you this is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
his death, his burial, his resurrection. Now I know there's very, not very many people in comparison to the world population who actually believes in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But this is the exact gospel which you are required to believe so that your sins may be forgiven and you may have eternal life so that when you pass on from this life into the next, you'll be able to be present with the Lord. If not, you'll end up in a place called the lake of fire. It's the only gospel with God's own approval on it. That stamp of approval is the resurrection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul said in Galatians chapter 1 verse 8, But though we, or an angel uh, from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed, means doomed to destruction. Now there are many, as I said, who don't believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ. They don't believe about, uh, that his brutal crucifixion, his shed blood, his common burial, and his miraculous resurrection just three days later has anything to do with them or has any effect on them whatsoever. It is these that the Lord Jesus Christ has spoken against in 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1, verse 8 and 9, that says, In flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This is that gospel, exactly how you are to believe it. It's to be preached throughout the whole world that men and women and children may get saved so that they can escape the wrath of God, which is to be poured out upon them all the earth. It's nearly the time for the Lord's return. How long will you put this off? How long will you waffle between two positions? If the Lord is the Lord, serve Him. If the church is the way you're supposed to go, follow the church. But you'll end up in the lake of fire. You need to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the gospel that the, the uh, Jewish people must believe. It's the gospel that the Muslim people must believe. It's the gospel that people who call themselves Christians must believe. It's the ones that the Oriental the African and the European must believe if they are to be saved. You may be asking yourself, why must I believe this gospel? Or why must we believe in anything? Well, I hope it wouldn't bother you to think that God had told you that himself, that this is the gospel that you must believe if you are to be saved. I hope that is all you need because without the word of God, I could no uh, way, in no wise be able to convince you that this is the true gospel. It requires faith, believing faith, believing faith in a person, faith which God alone can give you, faith uh, which if you do not have can be yours if you really listen to and, and hear the word of God and apply it to your life. Romans 10 verse 17 says, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So this is where real faith is. This is saving faith. This is not faith in your fellow man or faith and what you think might be God. This is faith in the Word of God, believing what it says. With that, I'm going to present to you what the Word of God has to say about three great guarantees in Christ's resurrection, which I hope will help your faith so that you may believe. Now, there are guarantees, and there's wonderful guarantees. There's people who think that the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is just a, a fairy tale, a fallacy, nothing to be concerned about. And yet those of us who are saved, it's the power of God to think that he was able to raise someone from the dead. And now we have that same hope that one day he'll raise us from the dead. The guarantee of our Savior, Jesus Christ. The resurrection declares Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Romans chapter 1, verse is, verses 3 and 4. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. There you have it. All conquerors in this world from the very beginning of time have been conquered by one particular enemy, and that enemy is death. All kings and all rulers have been ruled by death. All renowned philosophers have died the same as the fool. Philosophy is literally the love of wisdom. And I have to read you a part of Paul's letter to the church of Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 17 through 21, 
says, For Christ sent me to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise, and where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not get God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. You see, it pleases God by the foolishness or supposed foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. Save them from what? Save them from hell. Save them from the lake of fire. Save them from eternal damnation. That's why he came to save. Now, go down to verse 27. It says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the things that are wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. In other words, you're not going to be able to get into heaven by saying, Oh, I did this and I did that and I did this other thing as well. No, you have to depend on the work of someone else, someone who is righteous, someone who has been raised from the dead, someone who all this stuff has already been done to, if you have any hope of the resurrection unto eternal life. You must believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. That's the gospel that you must believe. And then he says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. Any philosopher, either ancient or modern, who refuse or reject the gospel of Jesus Christ is doomed to be accursed of God. Religious leaders end up in their graves as well. Catholic popes, Muslim ayatollahs and imams, Buddhist monks and priests, Baptist preachers and, and pastors, they fill many of the world's graves. But the fact of the matter remains, did they believe on the Lord Jesus Christ before they drew their last breath? Where will they end up in eternity? Where will you end up in eternity? Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us why they end up in death. Wherefore is by one man, that's Adam, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Have you got a more valid explanation than God's word for this enemy of life called death? And so it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. All who have gone before us have breathed the same air, and they walked in the same sunshine as you and I do today. They were unable to stop death from knocking at their door and taking their life. Samson was not strong enough to resist the call of death. Solomon was not wise enough to figure out how to escape death. Methuselah lived 969 years, but he finally had to call it quits when death came to take his life. All these had died. Some were believers, others were not. But Jesus Christ conquered death once and for all. His resurrection was the sign to the Jewish nation that he is truly the Son of God. And thank God that he's allowed the Gentiles to be partakers of his own holiness and grace. That we might be able to receive the gift of eternal life through this risen Son of God. Jesus had prophesied that he would rise victorious over death in John chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. If your Bible doesn't say those exact words, get a King James Bible, because that's where the truth is. Jesus also spoke to them of the sign of the prophet Jonah. Yes, we believe Jonah was swallowed by a whale. 
There's nothing fantastic about that, certainly out of the ordinary. But we also believe that the, the Red Sea parted and the children of Israel with Moses went across on dry ground. And when the Pharaoh's army came, the whole waters came back in and drowned every one of them. It's amazing. Matthew 12, verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonas. And behold, a greater than Jonas is here, speaking of himself. Before Jesus was crucified, he told the disciples in John chapter 10, verse 17 and 18, My Father loveth me, because I laid down my life, that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment has I, have I received of my Father, and take it again he did. All those who put their trust in him shall never be ashamed. Romans chapter 10, verse 11. Jesus Christ is alive. Jesus Christ is sitting on the right hand of the Father up on his throne in heaven. And he's waiting until that day when he comes back to claim all those who believe on him. Are you ready for that day? John chapter 6, verse 39 says, Jesus said, This is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And later on in verse 44, Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Proof positive that our guarantee is in Jesus Christ. Have you come to Christ by faith and trusted in him alone and nothing else to save your soul? Or are you clinging to something else and Jesus? That won't work. Let the other things go and believe only on the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting his finished work for your salvation. He, uh, we have his and his Father's guarantee in writing that Jesus is the only Savior. Here's the second guarantee, the guarantee of God's salvation. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 17, which I read, If Christ be not raised, your faith is vain, ye are yet in your sins, then also they which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of of them that slept. If Christ be not raised, well, that's a fearful if. If Christ be not raised, you are yet in your sins. Every person who has uh, put their faith and trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ, if he's not risen from the dead, they're still in their sins. I'm still in my sin, if this were true. If Christ be not raised, then I'm not forgiven, and neither are you, and neither can you ever be. You would remain eternally guilty of sinning against God. If Christ be not raised, your loved ones who are now gone on into eternity are perished forever, never to be seen again. Every terminal illness would continue eternally if Christ be not raised. Your joy that you have, I'm talking to believers, the joy that you have in Christ will be just a fool's folly, something that you worked up in the flesh. There would be nothing worth living for. What advantage would life give you if the dead rise not? You would live by the maxim, let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 32. But Christ is raised from the dead. And if you will believe it, then all of the negatives that I just read to you would turn into positives. Because this is just what believers are graciously entitled to enjoy the moment they repent and turn to Jesus Christ. God's salvation, which is permanent. Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 28, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Secondly, they have God's forgiveness for confessed sin. 1 John 1, 9 tells us if we confess our sin, not to some man, but unto the Lord himself, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Listen, men, and listen, ladies, and listen, children, you don't have to tell your sins to anybody who calls himself a priest or a father. You can go directly to God through Jesus Christ if you so choose. He won't hold those things against you. 
Someone else may. They're just men. They have no power to forgive sins unless you've sinned against them personally. Can't you figure that out? God's heavenly peace and joy uh, for your earthly sorrows is something you have to look forward to. John chapter 14, verse 27, Jesus said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And then again in 1633, it says, In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Those are the precious words of Jesus Christ. And now you have one other precious promise, God's preparations for after your death. In John chapter 14, the first three verses. Listen, only in the King James does it give you this blessed promise. Ah, let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, uh, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. The third guarantee that we have is this. The guarantee of a similar resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some will not taste death before Christ returns for his believing church. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 uh, on down say, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, and so uh, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. So the Lord's not going to send St. Peter. The Lord's not going to send uh, some other person. He's coming himself to collect the believers who love him and have trusted him. I hope you're one who's loved him and trusted him. Because he's coming for you. And he's going to treat you as, your, as you are his child. And he's going to take you home to be with him forever. And there you're going to face the judgment seat of Jesus Christ to be judged for the things you did in your body, whether it was good or bad, uh, just like a parent would. And so then we're going to enjoy the, uh, the rewards or the disappointments of lives either live for Christ or uh, not for Christ. And, and then we're going to have the marriage supper of the Lamb, and then there's going to be some fantastic things that are going to be happening depicted in the book of Revelation, which we will partake of. But he's going to come in the clouds. He's going to come just like he says. This is why I say to you, please, take your Bibles. Take your King James Bible. Open it up. Look up these references and read them word for word and get the understanding of it. Don't let anything slip past you. Then Paul tells, tells us this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 53. He says this, Behold, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Christ himself claims that he has tasted death for every single individual. Even the unsaved, he's, he's already died for your sins. But it won't be of any effect to you at all unless you put your faith and trust in him. Now, he's done this for you. And praise the Lord, he's also tasted victory for every single person. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, so he has promised to come back for those who love and obey him. And then we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. 1 Corinthians 15, 54 says this. When this corruptible, our natures, our bodies tendency to fall apart, shall have put on incorruption, where that can't happen. And this mortal, our body, shall have put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Do you get it yet? That it's through Jesus Christ alone, over and over and over again in the scriptures. It's not by someone else. It's not by Mary. It's not by Peter. It's not by anyone but the Lord Jesus Christ that you can be forgiven and have that eternal home in heaven. If you just trust in his finished work, stop trusting in your own self-righteousness. 
Look to others if you want to, to try to find such sureness, such surety if you will. Or look to yourself if you're so inclined. But I'm pointing you to one today who has gotten the victory over your sworn enemy who is death. Death is coming for you. He'll be knocking on your door and you will not be able to resist his call. Oh, you may be able to put him off for a little while. But eventually he'll come and take you away. <clears throat> now this sworn enemy of death is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ himself, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he is alive forevermore. What wonderful news, what, what blessed things can be yours if you would just put your faith and trust in him. One day he's going to do away with death forever. The Apostle John prophesied in the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter number 20, verse 11. I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose faith the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now, these aren't Christians. These are people who rejected Jesus Christ. This is a whole different group right here. So they're being judged for their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Is your name in the Lamb's book of life? I hope that it would be, but it can only be in there if you put your faith and trust and what God says about his son, the Lord Jesus. But be warned, thinking about Jesus is not enough to save you. Talking about him will not secure your soul for all eternity. Adoring his godly character and following his impeccable teachings will not cleanse and forgive you. Only repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ will secure your place in God's eternal home. Acts chapter 20, verse 21, and John 14, verse 2. There's a terrible day coming. The day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 10 through 17. Now listen, if you're already believing, then rest in these great guarantees in our Savior, in God's salvation, and in our similar resurrection. If you're not, listen, Christ is risen from the dead. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. I want to thank you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.